I'd like to get started. Everybody at the University of Zurich already knows this. Whenever I do like means that you're starting the lecture. Okay. There was a question about the sign up in Let's MT. Um, but maybe we can postpone this for the time being. My plan for this morning is the following. My plan for this morning is the following. My plan for this morning is on the board. I am first going to talk about neural machine translation and then about sentence and word alignment. I uh, want to look a little bit about the Let's MT output that you might have gotten if it worked for you. And if we have time left in the end, I want to show some corpus, parallel corpus search systems that we have built and uh, would like to share with you. The first, let's start with a summary of what we learned yesterday. Two slides. Um, we looked very briefly into rule-based machine translation systems, which have been a traditional approach to machine translation from the 1960s all the way to the 1990s. Then statistical machine translation has taken over, has been the dominant paradigm from around 2000 on. Uh, now it's neural machine translation. Statistical MT is based on a formula to find the maximal value based on probabilities in the translation model and the language model. And everybody by now should know what the translation model and the language model is. Questions to translation model and the language model. Machine translation is inherently difficult because of different types of ambiguities in natural language. Um, for statistical machine translation, all we need is a large amount of human translated text. Uh, high quality in the respective domain and statistical empty systems can be built quickly and work best on the same text types that they're trained on. I think those were the messages I tried to get across yesterday. Any other questions on what we learned yesterday or what I presented yesterday? Maybe some hot topics that are uh, in the discussion in both statistical and also now in neural machine translation. One is the main adaptation. So the typical scenario that we have is that we have a small amount of training material, a small amount of translated material in the particular domain and that would not be enough for building a system, a good system, but we have all kinds of other parallel corpora. So if we want to build a system for um, Croatian to English machine translation, we might have large uh, amounts, millions of words uh, from European proceedings, Europarl. But if you want to have a system that is well suited for the tourism industry, you might only have a small domain specific corpus. And then the question is how to balance the two things. So if we throw everything in the same pot, then the large out of domain corpus will be so much more dominant in our collection. So it's always a good idea then to use domain adaptation techniques so that the small in-domain material, so the small material that we have from the tourism, gets more importance in our machine translation system. And there are tools to do this. Then there's ideas of combining rule-based and statistical systems, or one should probably say linguistic knowledge and statistic knowledge. There's various different ways of doing this, uh, especially for languages that have less resources. And then one thing that I'm really waiting for, and I've been waiting for this quite a while, 
is the so-called confidence factor, or sometimes also called quality estimation. And the idea is the following, that the machine translation system should be able to decide if it can do a good job for translating a given sentence. And if the machine translation system says, well, this is a complicated sentence, I cannot really translate this well, it should not translate it at all. So that the human translator who does the post editing does not have to deal with garbage machine translation. So that's really what I'm hoping for. And that's what researchers in machine translation have been working on for the last 10 years. Uh, it's not a core topic, but it's one of the important topics. And it's very difficult to do this. So something that you are very used to from translation memories, where you have a fuzzy match threshold, and only if your fuzzy match is above that threshold, then you're getting the suggestion from the translation memory. You would like to have something similar to this from the machine translation. Why is it so much more complicated that the machine translation system knows how good the suggestion is? Why why is it so much easier for translation memories? Question to you. How does fuzzy match work in, in, in translation memories? Right, and what is 70% matching? What, what, what matches? Right. Now, my question is, what does, in the background, how is the 70% computed? What, what is the matching of the number of words? No? It's not, some, some of the translation memory system make a distinction between function words and non-function words and so on. But it's more or less, it's uh, out of 20 words, if, um, no, let's see, if, 10 words match, then it's 50%. If uh, 15 words match, then it's 75%. So that's the idea. And you need to hear the of And here, of course, there's nothing to compare against. Mm -hmm. huh? So what do we have as indicators? What does the machine translation system have as indicators whether a sentence is difficult or easy to translate? The language model gives some indication because of the fluency uh, considerations. If there is less fluency, uh, then could be that could be used. Um, the language model is dependent on the length of the sentence, so that makes it a bit tricky. Uh, if there is output on different lengths, which one is prefer preferable? So this is but this is one option. The language model which tells us about the fluency in the target language, that can give an indication if a sentence is well translated or not so good translated. What other means do we, does the machine translation system have to decide if a sentence is well translated or not so good translated? What do you think? The context. The context, how can that be measured? Some linking words. Linking words. So if there are pronouns that are linking to previous text, then it can already say this is risky because anything that goes outside has connections to outside of the sentence. We learned that almost all machine translation systems translate sentence by sentence. So if it has links to something outside of the sentence, then it's more difficult for machine translation. But very easy indicator is the number of unknown words. So the number of words the system has not seen is a good indicator. I mean, if out of 10 words, five words it hasn't seen, how on earth can it make a good suggestion for the sentence? But why is even this criterion tricky? 
because oftentimes unknown words are names. And if there are just three names in there, you still want the machine translation system to make the, tr the translation because the names just don't change. You just take them from the input to the output. I know that in some languages you have to put endings on the names and so on and spelling changes, but more or less names are taken over. So just looking at the number of unknown words is not even a good indicator if something should be machine translated. So I just want to give you a, an, a feeling of why this confidence factor business or quality estimation business is such a tricky business. So actually what has been found to be the most reliable indicator for difficulty in machine <coughs> translation is sentence length. The longer the sentence, the more complicated it is. And over a certain length, a machine translation system should probably not uh, translate it at all because the chances are very, very high that it messes up the sentence. So, just to give you an idea. Okay, but now we're coming to the wonders of the new world, uh, neural machine translation. Um, <clears throat> the whole thing started about a year ago when uh, Google announced uh, that they would now use a neural machine translation in order to increase fluency and accuracy. Fluency is how natural it sounds in the target language and accuracy of course means how good is the content from the source represented in the target. So these are the two dimensions that we always need to keep in mind. We want to produce fluent output and we want to produce accurate output. And it turns out, it experience now after a year tells us that neural machine translation really is very good at fluency, but accuracy is not always given. Some people even claim that neural machine translation output is more difficult for post-editing because of fluency, which means you as a post-editor you see a fluent sentence and it's very easy to be misled and say, okay, this is a great sentence, I'll leave it. Not noticing that there's some important part of the source sentence missing in it. Whereas in the old times, in the statistical machine translation times, you were rather sure if the content if the, if, if, is not absolutely represented in the target language and also the target language sentence is somehow misconstructed. So it was easier to detect the mistakes. This was the example sentence that Google advertised. Uh, Probleme kann man niemals mit derselben Denkweise lösen, durch die sie entstanden sind. In the old days, this was translated as no problem can be solved from the same consciousness that they have arisen. And now with neural machine translation, it says problems can never be solved with the same way of thinking that caused them. So that is definitely a much better translation. What is the basic insight? Why is neural translation better than statistical translation? Um, the idea is that neural machine translation uses a broader context within the sentence. So if you think about the statistical machine translation, I explained to you yesterday, we are cutting sentences apart and we are reassembling bits and pieces from old translations in order to produce new ones. But when we are doing this reassembling, we are basically looking a little bit to the left and making our decision and then we are using the language model in order to understand the fluency. But now in neural machine translation, for every decision that we are doing, for every decision that the neural machine translation system does, it takes the whole sentence into consideration. So it has more information at each and every decision point. And now Spela is missing because she asked when was the time that neural actually took over for the language pair English to German, which is inherently a difficult translation direction. And there is a series of competitions 
which are called WMT, Workshop on Machine Translation. And the group from Edinburgh is one of the leading research teams. And you see that in 2013, their system scored 20 player points um, and a syntax-based a, a system that combined statistical with some linguistics was slightly worse. That they really invested a lot of work in syntax-based machine translation. They even wrote a book about syntax-based machine translation which came out in the year 2016 at exactly the same time when this was totally out of fashion. <laughs> Um, and you see that in 2015, neural machine translation was still worse. And only in 2016, out of a sudden, we're getting four plur points improvement over the syntax-based statistical machine translation. So it's clearly better based on automatic evaluation means than anything we have seen before. For this particular language, we are English German, which needs a lot of rearrangement. So I would like to go through you, with you through three questions here. What is an artificial neural network? Um, how does such a network learn how to translate? And how is it used in machine translation? Okay. Step number one, what is a artificial neural network? And I'm saying artificial neural network because we're not talking about any biological neural networks here. Maybe it's a bit inspired by the way we think the brain works. I don't really know how the brain works, but the way we think the brain works. Um, but it's a software architecture. So please don't go home and, and tell your friends and partners at home that Martin Falk told you something about how the brain works. I don't. Uh, I'm telling you how a computer works uh, that works with neural networks. So this is a very simple neural network. And I want to spend uh, two or three minutes on this so that we understand uh, the basic principle. We have an input layer here, which is um, a number of input nodes. We have a middle layer, which is called the hidden layer. It's inside the network. And we have an output. So we go from left to right here. And on the input side, we can insert a number. For example, the number one here which is then multiplied with the weight on the link between the input layer and the hidden layer. So we would say 1 times 3, get the value 3 here, and add to this the value which we're getting from here and the value which we're getting from there. So let's assume we have 1, 0 here. So we have 1 times 3, 0 times 4, and 1 times minus 2, so we have 3 minus 2, so the value that we're getting here is the value 1. And then we're doing the same thing here, we get the value here and here and here, and then we are multiplying whatever we have here with this, not with this weight here, we're multiplying this and adding all this and then we're getting the output. So that is pretty easy. That's the basic idea, and that's how neural machine translation works, surprisingly. Uh -huh. um, we have, of course, many more input nodes, not only three, maybe a thousand. We have not only one hidden layer, we might have five or eight hidden layers behind each other, all of them highly interconnected. I show some pictures in a moment. And we are not only having one output value, but we have a whole array of output values. So we might have y0 to y1000 on the output side. So all the neural network does is it gets basically an activation on the input side. Then it propagates this through the hidden layers based on the weights that it has. And then in the output we're getting numbers, which we then interpret as words again for the machine translation. So when we use this for a machine translation, what we need to do is, in the training, for a given word, we need to adjust the weights so that we get the exact right output word 
on the basis of the words in the, con in the sentence. So training a neural network, training a system to translate with a neural network machine translation system basically means adjusting these weights. So it might not be 3 here, for a particular word this might be 2.5, for another word this is 1.4, and so on and so forth. And that's the kind of training that we do automatically. No, the vectors are basically the, the, the sequences of input uh, that we have. That's called a vector because it's a, it's, a, it's a sequence of numbers, so to speak. And you can have a vector here, a vector there, and, and on each and every level you can have a vector. Right? And the weights are really the... If you... In, in, in terms of the brain, this is the, the, the activation strength, so to speak. Um, so when you hear a certain word, when I'm telling you the word tree, uh, certain... <clears throat> pictures come in front of your mind, so it's certain images are triggered, and that is supposed to simulate similarly, if we have the word tree here, then we should have on the German side the word Baum as the output. Um, trying to approach this step by step, the um, multiplication that we're doing on the weights, that is clear, but the, what we're doing with the values on the hidden layers, that is higher mathematics. And that is um, using so-called activation functions. So we are not only summing things up, but we are also deciding whether a certain value should be above or below a threshold. Maybe that's intuitively what it is. I'm not going to go into these uh, functions here. Um, the important thing is that these activation functions are meant to switch off certain neurons. So based on certain words, certain connections are triggered and other ones are suppressed. <coughs> they, there is a transition region where not much happens and then there's activated neurons. So certain things are triggered, certain things are turned off and that's what we need in order to propagate a certain numerical pattern through such a network. Okay. Down in the computer, all that happens is a lot of mathematics. It's a lot of computation um, based on this particular architecture that I just showed you. The architecture looks a little bit more like this. Now we're going from the bottom to the top. So we have an input layer, we have maybe two hidden layers, and we have an output layer. And remember, everything is connected to everything. So every node from the input layer is connected to every node in the next in hidden layer, and so on and so forth, so that all this <coughs> can help to uh, build the model can build the system that helps you to translate a certain word from English into German or from Slovenian into Croatian. Now, I told you that neural networks have the advantage of accessing information from the complete sentence at all times. And a system like this, this looks like what well, we're giving it one word here, and then we're getting the translation of a word, but how does it remember, how does it access information from previous or subsequent nodes? And that's why the architecture is even more complicated. It's called recurrent neural networks. So these are neural networks <coughs> that remember information over multiple steps. So for a given word, we are remembering all the information that we've used in previous words. So information is not only, basically, it's not only flowing from the input layer to the output layer, but it's also stored in these layers for the next word to be processed. 
That's why it's called recurrent neural networks. And that means that on um, translations, we are actually able to uh, capture long distance dependencies. You might remember that from your linguistic studies. Long distance dependencies are things like um, he doesn't have very much confidence in himself, so we need to remember when we are translating this word in German, it's the word selbst. Doesn't tell you whether it's um, masculine or feminine. But in English, you need to make a decision in the very end of the sentence, which is based on the very beginning of the sentence. And this can be done on recurrent neural networks because they are saving the information throughout the sentence. So I'm from German here as well. So that's my very basic introduction of what an artificial neural network is. Now, how does a neural network learn? It uses supervised learning. That means we are comparing the behavior of the network with the expected output. So, in the beginning, we initialize the weights in our network. You remember the weights are the multiplication factors on the edges. Uh, we are initializing them with some random values. And then we are saying the sentence, das ist ein schönes Haus, shall be aligned with, um, this is a nice house. And then we are translating, das ist ein schönes Haus, into English, and then we are saying, ah, this is not correct yet, we need to adjust the weights. And there is some mathematics involved in this, which tells us in which direction we need to shift the weights. Do we need to increase them? Do we need to decrease them? Which weight needs to go up? Which weight needs to go down? In order to get closer to the desired output sentence. Where do we get the input and output sentences from? Well, that's our parallel corpus. That's exactly the same starting point that we have in statistical machine translation. And now we're using this parallel corpus in order to adjust weights in such a network. And then we are repeating this over and over. So we are computing the output values, we are comparing the output values with the expected output. So we are comparing the current translation against the expected translation. We are adjusting the weights <coughs> until, based on <coughs> our sentences in the corpus, we are getting the sentences in the target language that we want. So that's the training step. And you can imagine that takes a while because we are in need to go through our network again and again and again in order to adjust these weights. And I say this whole thing stops until convergence, that means when from one step to the next our weights change only very, very little, then we say we're done. We're not improving this any further. It takes a long time, that's why we're using special computers to work with neural networks, you might have heard about this. It's not possible, well it's possible to do this on a, on a regular desktop computer, but you'll be waiting for months. Uh, whereas if you're using a special system which is called uh, GPU server, you're using so-called graphical processing units, not CPU, but GPU, graphical processing units, because they are optimized for this kind of matrix computation, a lot of vector computations that we need, and so um, it only takes maybe a week to build the system. But with the tra same training data that we had for statistical, we might take a day, and now with neural machine translation it might take a week. So it takes longer, it's a lot more effort to build such a system computationally, we can go and go on vacation during this week, that's nice. Uh, but then, in the end, <coughs> it should be better. So what can such a neural network learn? It can learn many different things. Uh, for example, it has been used in image recognition. So if you're feeding it a thousand images that contain a frisbee, 
And always there is a description, a woman is throwing a frisbee in the park, the boys are using a frisbee, there's a frisbee in the picture, whatever. It will learn that there is a, in all these images, there is some round object, and which obviously is called a frisbee. Because that is the word that goes with these thousand images. And the same for a dog or a stop sign or things like that. Exactly. That's why it's called supervised learning. Supervised learning means we have a manually judged starting point. And in this example, it is descriptions of what kind of objects are there, and you need many of them. And in machine translations, it's the translations that we have been doing over the last 10 years. There was a political scandal yeah. that things like this can happen. But other than that, I mean, you have probably used some um, systems already that, that do face recognition even of your friends that uh, you, and, and this is the kind of technology that can be used and can improve these things. Now, anything where you have patterns, where you have regular things that occur over and over can be learned with neural networks. So neural networks have improved speech recognition a lot. So speech recognition meaning the automatic conversion from spoken language into text. They have improved OCR, optical character recognition. They have been used in automatically correcting OCR errors. Uh, because they know that the word schöner in German is much more frequently than Serener, which is an incorrect word. And they have been used to normalize historical and dialecting spelling variants because you can translate this word into that word because this is much more frequent letter combination than this one. And what I want to make you aware of is that in all these applications, or in many of these applications, the neural network is actually solving the exactly same task. In speech recognition, we have an audio signal, and the neural network is supposed to tell us what is the most likely next word given the audio signal. In OCR, based on running text, what is the most likely next word given the scan image? And in machine translation, it is what is the most likely next word given the source input sentence? So it's always the same question. And basically, a neural network is a language model, a fancy language model, which knows a lot about what is the most likely next word given a sequence of words. Which of course means that the first word in a sentence is the most difficult because you don't have a like <coughs> next word. But then, in principle, you can run it backwards. You can say, you run it in one direction, run it in the other direction, and then the first word is actually the last word in the sentence, and then uh, it helps you. So that's just to get you a basic understanding of what neural networks are. Now let's come to neural networks in machine translation. And I had one most important slide for a statistical machine translation. Here comes my most important slide on neural machine translation. The first thing is we need to make a decision how we want to represent the words. And we need to represent the words as sequences of numbers. And for neural networks, we typically input one or zero in order to activate um, a neuron. So one way of doing this is we are assigning such a vector to each word in our vocabulary. So here our vocabulary is only five tokens, five words. So here Peter is represented as one, followed by four zeros. Bob is 
as the one on the second position and so on, then we can have this as the input sequence, that's the input activation on our neural network. The problem with this is if our vocabulary is 50,000 uh, different words, then we need an input layer of 50,000 different input nodes. And 50,000 words, you know, is not really enough for a decent language, natural language. You need at least 100,000, maybe 200,000, depending on how much morphology you have and so on. So what, people are, what, what can you do in order to reduce the vocabulary? There's many easy things. You can, for example, say you are not making any distinction between upper casing and lower casing. That reduces the number of words. Um, but you can also say that uh, you want to represent Peter in very much the same way as any other person name. And that's what this layer is, word embeddings. Word embeddings are automatic computations of word similarities, semantic similarities. Words that appear in similar context and that trigger similar context words. So one way of reducing the vocabulary is to use word embeddings because we are not, we are not representing Peter and Hans and uh, all names differently but we are representing them in, in similar ways. And that's why we are using word embeddings. That's a typical thing. Then comes our um, neural network. And the first step that it does, it tries to represent the weights, it tries to adjust the weights in order to re represent the complete input sentence. And then from there, this is called the encoding step, it triggers the next hidden layer, which will then start decoding, basically generating the output in the target language, which will then again represent words as such number sequences. And the fact that this 1000 here results in 1000 is an accident. I mean, it could be any number combination there. And based on that, we are decoding the words on the target side. So this is the basic setup. We're having so-called encoding, decoding neural networks. What is the take-home message here? It's a complicated setup. It's a lot of mathematics. It's um, powerful in that it considers complete sentence context. And it is also computationally expensive, it takes a long time to train. I think these are important things that you need to remember. I should also mention that one way of reducing the vocabulary, you said this is an issue here, how many different representations we need for a large vocabulary. One way of, represent, of reducing the vocabulary is to work with letter sequences rather than complete words. So rather than having Peter here, we have the letter sequence PET and then followed by ETE and then followed by TER. And the number of letter sequences, three letter sequences, of course, is lower than the number of words that we have. Different letter sequences is lower. So that reduces the vocabulary. And since we are Looking at the complete sentence context, that means when we're translating a certain letter sequence, we're actually looking at the next letter sequences that basically is the same as translating the word Peter completely because we are then taking considerations of the different parts of Peter when we're translating. And now you remember my first slide yesterday where I showed that Europäische with a spelling error was incorrectly translated as European without an R. And this is exactly what you get 
when we're translating letter sequences in this particular way. And neural machine translation systems that you see today usually do not work on complete words, they work on letter sequences, which is magic to me. Uh, how on earth can you translate letter sequences and still get a meaningful output? Um, but as we see, it works well. Um, where you have a couple of thousand characters should in principle be easier than here because the vocabulary is just maybe 10,000 different characters whereas here we have 100,000 different words so in principle it should be easier but I'm not an expert in Chinese machine translation <laughs> Exactly. So basically, it can go back and forth in any direction, which means that it is natural that the quality of this, if this output should be better than the machine. Right. Um, true, but still, most of the time, what we see today in output of neural machine translation is sentence by sentence, for the simple reasons of efficiency, um, because takes a moment to translate a sentence and if Google wants to deliver the, out, the, the translation of a text instantaneously they have to distribute it to multiple servers mm -hmm. and if they do this then they have to translate sentences independently but in principle you're absolutely right the delimiter is an artificial thing you could have a window going over this uh, and take things from the next, from the previous <coughs> sentence into consideration, maybe even from the next sentence. Okay, that's a topic for Friday, uh, where we talk about the future of machine translation. Yeah, this sentence limitation is computationally intensive when you're producing a sentence or when you're producing the engine. Um, most of the time, when you're when you're producing the when you're producing the output, because you want to produce the output as, as quickly as possible. I think in the training, I don't think it's that much of an issue. But in the uh, in the actual translation, if you want to translate really on on the twink of an eye, then you need to distribute on parallel machines, um, and then that means you have to split your text into sentences. Two more slides to impress you and then we're done with new machine translation um, this is a way of showing you that we want information from the previous word when we are translating the current word and that means all the information from the previous word this is maybe one word here representing from six notes uh, is used when we're translating this note uh, uh, this word, and then we're going through the different layers of our network. And now we have a view. Next slide is a view into one of these nodes here. I've showed you these activation functions, but the, matter, the, the fact of the matter is the mathematics is much more complicated than this. Um, so there's input coming from the previous node, there's input coming from the input layer, and then it's computed as a number of functions in here in order to give an information to the next layer. Stop here. I want to make sure that um, you know that there are some online neural machine translation systems available. Uh, one is Google for a number of languages. Uh, then there is from Systran a uh, website which is called Pure Neural MT and then there is something that I discovered only recently Bartu has mentioned this yesterday uh, it's a small company in Germany and they claim to have the world's best machine translation and you are welcome to challenge them and see if that is really true Bartu mentioned that currently supports like seven eight languages um, so it's not. Unfortunately, no, Slovenia, no Czech. Right, but uh, I tried it out for German and English, and 
I found it quite impressive. Um, I, I checked this particular text here, um, Alpine Mountaineering text, and I was surprised that it takes, for example, there is um, in his book, Summit 150 Years of the Alpine Club, that it actually takes over this name of the uh, book literally into the target language, which I thought is fine. First I thought, ah, maybe it's only based on capitalization. You know? So this is capitalized, this is capitalized, this is capitalized, so it takes these words over. But then it's doing a little smarter because otherwise <laughs> of the would also be translated in some way. So somehow it realizes that this is an aim and should not be touched. And then if you look at also the um, uh, positioning of the verbs, it's, it's pretty good. Um, so here the regelmäßig verliehen werden, so a verb in the end, uh, whereas here which, which are regularly lent out to exhibitions, so I think that's done quite a good job. What exactly this company does in order to produce this, we don't know. Uh, they say it's neural machine translation and the rest is their intellectual property. Yeah? So we don't know exactly what happens there. So you think it should do this to put it no, in? No, I, I find it really, it's really difficult job. Yeah, it is a difficult job. That is true. Um, so it, that would be higher art to put even. In. Oh. Yeah, but, uh, the, the answer, the answer, the ah, here it has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here it has done. It was, uh, the Alpine Journal, right, right. It has done exactly this here. So higher art has been performed here. So hands off the system. <laughs> done very nicely and um, yeah. Let's summarize here neural machine translation achieves better quality than previous approaches, uses larger sentence context. Now some challenges, just before you go home and say the wonders and everything is, is perfect here. Yeah. NMT systems have a tendency to prefer fluency over adequacy or accuracy. I mentioned that already, which may result in word omissions. NMT systems need more parallel text for training than SMT. So if you have only limited amount of material, then maybe SMT is a better choice. If you have a lot of material, a lot of text translated, then NMT should give you a better quality. Energy systems are weak on low frequency words, for example, rare word forms. Um, I'm not commenting on this now because otherwise it will take too much time. Uh, energy systems are worse on very long sentences. I already mentioned that SMT has a hard time on long sentences, but now we're talking about very long sentences. I checked this paper and they're talking about sentences with, uh, I think, more than 60 words per sentence of rather unusual sentences. I mean, an average sentence in a newspaper has about 20 words, and once it's long, it has maybe 30 words, so in extreme cases, NMT gets worse. Um, and then NMT systems are difficult to interpret. I mean, how does the system get from the input to the output? If you want to understand this, if you want to fix a bug, if you want to influence this, it might actually be tricky to an understanding of how all these things in that neural network works. Which is also, by the way, a um, research area that a lot of people are working on because neural networks are also used for basically, for, for example, um, giving diagnosis for certain uh, diseases based on certain symptoms that must be this disease. And if you're not if you cannot give the explanation of why you came up with this conclusion, that might not be helpful for, for a doctor. Um, same for um, stock developments uh, on, the, on the stock market. If you cannot give an explanation of why you're predicting that this is the next hot thing, it might not be 
something that the broker wants to jump onto. Um, need to show you this because it's the most hilarious mistake and I'm showing this to everybody. Now that you're a dream girl of millions of your fans, ich weiß, dass sie ein Traummädchen sind von den Millionen ihrer Ventilatoren. Um, and so my motto is, you can do better than that. Uh, so fans here being mistranslated as Ventilatoren or Ventilateuren. Um, in this subtitle of this Bollywood film, 10 years ago, it's, it's a rather old mistake. Okay. Neural machine translations, question to that? Okay, let's come to sentence and word alignment. Daya has talked about uh, parallel copra already this morning. I want to continue with this. And uh, my favorite picture is, is actually this um, very small parallel corpus that I photographed myself. Uh, this street sign in which country? Sweden. Somebody says Sweden? Yeah. Finland? Okay. Why? Exactly. I mean, Finland is bilingual. Um, there is a minority of about um, almost 10% of the population as Swedish mother tongue. And so they have street signs in Swedish and Finnish. So first thing that we need to do in a parallel corpus, we need to do language identification. That's what we just did. We determined <coughs> that we are dealing with two languages and if we are a little bit more informed, the one below is Swedish and the one above is Finnish. Okay. Now, based on, on these two pairs of words, we can already say a few words. What is the word for a street in Swedish? Katan, obviously, because that's the ending that we have here and there. What is the word for street in Finnish? Kato, easy enough. Uh, what is Nilkander? A name. In any case, it must be, or it's very likely to be a name because it's the same in Swedish and Finnish. If it's not a name, then chances are that it needs to be translated in one way or another. So it's a name. So I think it's a person, a person name, typical person. Um, and then we go on on the right hand side. Um, let's try to understand what hamgata means. It will be some thing like wheat, some wheat street or something like that. Wheat street? Yeah, yeah it was okay. random word. Just, just some item. Some item. item. If we look a bit at the context. Hum. Uh, what does it sound like? Uh, sounds, uh, if, you, if you think about German and so on, so hum is the Swedish word for harbor. Uh, uh, so hum is the Swedish word for harbor. So knowing this, uh, so we are close to the beach here, knowing this, now what is the Finnish word for harbor? Uh, so, we can learn an unbelievable amount from parallel data. And that's the basic idea of why I like parallel data. can be used for language learning, translation, linguistics, translation studies, and of course language technology, language teaching, corpus annotation, and so on. And uh, I mentioned to you that we have built some um, Parallel corpus search systems start with showing you one. It's called Bilinguis, bilingual word information system. And what it is, we put in the yearbooks of the Swiss Alpine Club from the last 50 years, and we automatically computed sentence alignment. We automatically computed word alignment, which word corresponds to what. 
And so now you can enter a search term like Sturm, storm in English, and find out what it has been translated with in French over these 50 years. And we see that in 202 times it has been translated with trompette. And then in about 12 times it has been translated with tourmente, and we see the examples there. And uh, six times with orage, and three times with us. Okay. So we, we have a bilingual dictionary, and we have the frequencies. So I think it's a nice resource also for translators to use the parallel data that you have compiled um, in order to understand what are the most likely translation variants in your area. Now, my point here is that word alignment makes all the difference. If you don't have word alignment, if you do not know which word is the corresponding word from Sturm in this particular sentence, then you cannot compute frequencies and you cannot show the correspondences. So how is word alignment computed? Um, let's jump to uh, Centauri and Arcturan, two invented languages. And I want to explain to you how automatic word alignment works. Okay? Anybody knows this already, Centauri and Arcturan? Okay. Uh, it's an old example, it comes from Kevin Knight from 20 years ago, but I think it's wonderful. We have a parallel corpus, and your assignment now is to translate this sentence to Arcturan. Sentence says, Farok krok yok, yorok klok kantok ok yok. Okay? Now we want to find out what is the corresponding word for Farok in um, Arcturan. What is the corresponding word for Farok in Arcturan? How do you know? <laughs> yeah. It's the only word that is in both sentences, in both parallel sentences, where Farok occurs. Yeah. So we have Farok here and Farok there, and the only word that is in the corresponding Arcturan sentence is Yat. So, easy enough. Sentence. Um, Number two is croc, and croc unfortunately appears only once in our parallel corpus, so in principle it can be any of these words here. Unknown, or none, or none at all. No, that's also an option. So what can we do in order to identify if croc probably has a corresponding word? Exactly. We will try to locate all the other words in that sentence in order to find out. So let's let's just keep it for the moment and move on. Same story here. Heok has the parallel word at. Um, then Yorok has the parallel word mat. Clock can be any of these words. We do exactly what we said before, we are computing the alignments for all words and then we see that clock now needs to be aligned to but and in the end we also realize that there is nothing for prop. Nothing left because all the other words have been aligned so exactly as you said, clock doesn't have a correspondence. So this is how automatic word alignment works. Works. This is how statistical machine translation, in principle, computes automatic word alignment. Just not on a corpus with 12 sentence pairs, but on a corpus with uh, 100,000 sentence pairs, many more words. But this process of checking which words are available, which are the ones that are always on the other side, helps you to um, helps the system to find out the correspondences. Now, this actually, what we just looked at, is really Spanish English. It's not Centauri and Arcturan. 
All I did is basically for each word I showed you a word that is unknown. And this is exactly the situation for the computer. It doesn't know anything about these words, and so it does exactly this. Now, since we're getting close to 12 o'clock already, um, what can we do? I would like to show you um, a program that does sentence alignment. I guess most of you have worked with sentence alignment before. Uh, if you use the translation memory system and you have a parallel corpus, you are importing um, your parallel corpus and it gets automatically sentence aligned. Um, so we can have a look at this or we can study a bit more on word alignment. Let me just think of... I think... I would like to explain to you a bit on how alignment works because I think that's, that should be the sense of our course here that you understand how alignment works and then we're looking at the sentence alignment. Given a document collection, for example all the yearbooks of the Swiss Alpine Club that we digitized, we want to determine which document in language 1 is a translation of which document in language 2. Well, this can happen to you, you have uh, somebody gave you a collection of translated documents, they are not systematically named, they're systematically named and it's easy, but uh, they're not systematically named, how do you determine if document X is a translation of document Y? Well you can look at them, but you can also um, do this automatically. How would you do this? What can you use? A thousand documents in English and uh, a thousand documents in Croatian. How do you know which document from the English ones is a translation of which documents on the Croatian side? How can the computer determine this? See, we're getting tired now. I, the stretching, the stretching break is missing. Yeah. <laughs> Name that it is as a good candidate. Yeah? So, if there is uh, um, Bill Clinton in one document, and only on the other side in one document is Bill Clinton, then chances are very high that this is a translation. What else need to you, would you want to check? at least if the documents are of the same length, yeah? more or less. Yeah? Because number of sentences... Exactly. Matter. Number of sentences is not a very good indicator. You check, the, you compute the number of characters and then you see this has 10,521 characters. The other one has 11,125. So almost the same in length, good candidates for translation. So, length, maybe internal structure. It's easy to compute the number of paragraphs, for example. Compare the number of paragraphs. And then names, and then numbers. numbers. So these are the best indicators, easy indicators for computing whether two documents are translations of each other. Once you have that, you might still in the end maybe want to check this manually. There might be some occurrences where this doesn't work reliably, but most of the things you should actually be able to figure out. And this is more or less exactly the same thing that we're doing in sentence alignment. So, with the difference that in sentence alignment, many to one alignments are possible. So, you don't want to <coughs> compute only one sentence by one sentence, but you also want to find occurrences where one long sentence has been translated into two short sentences, or three <coughs> short sentences. And that you need to take into consideration. That's difficult, different from the document alignment issue. On the other hand, what all the sentence aligners assume is what we call the monotonicity of the sentence order. That the sentences in both documents are in the same order. 
<coughs> so sentence aligners cannot align sentences usually if they are not in the same order in those documents. They can skip certain sentences, but they're not able to deal with reordering of sentences across documents. That's their constraint. And that's, of course, different when you do word alignment. In word alignment, you have to be able to assume that words are in different order. And so we're using an algorithm that... Should I explain this? Maybe I'm skipping this. Because it's a very technical algorithm. It's called um, expectation maximization algorithm. You can maybe show this very briefly uh, with this example here. It starts under the assumption that all words are equally likely to be aligned to all other words in the corresponding sentences. And then on each round through the algorithm, it strengthens the words that co-occur. So here we see that la and the are good correspondences. And then in the next one, maison and house are good correspondences. And we do this until the system knows which are the corresponding sentences. Uh, in which are the corresponding words in the two sentences. Now, in the end, let's look at a nice little system for sentence alignment, which shows you a little bit how sentence alignment actually works. It's a system which is, called, which is free of charge, and it's called intertext. And I want to demonstrate this here. On a pair from English and German, and you may want to use this this afternoon if you like on text that you find or get from the internet for your own language pair. So let's load into the system first a German document and then an First one needs to be the German document, the second one the English one, because I specify this here. So this is the German one. And this is the English one. Now you see that uh, it has loaded, I unfortunately do not know how to enlarge the font here. <laughs> uh, it has loaded the document on the left in German, on the right in English. I already see that this is actually translation. Osteuropa steht vor einer schweren Kreditkrise, talking about a major credit crisis here. And I also want you to see that, for example, here we have uh, Joy Body. Uh, wie steht die Lage in Osteuropa genau? Wie sieht die Lage in Osteuropa genau aus? Um, that exactly is a corresponding here, but then here it is misaligned because here Anja Hochberg, we have the complete thing here and it's not aligned here. So what we want the system to do is to realize that these two things here correspond to this one here. Okay? And <coughs> we are running the sentence aligner. It's working now over I think 15,800 segments and it does two passes over this, it runs over this twice explaining in a second how it works and now I have realized that this thing here needs to correspond to this these two things here corresponds to this, and so on and so forth. 
And now this is an editor and you can go in and even fix alignment errors that the system has built. How has it done it? In a first pass it learns name correspondences, it learns also words that are good indicators of alignment because they only occur in certain corresponding sentences. And then in the second pass it uses this information in order to do the actual sentence alignment. This then can be exported from the system once you're done with the sentence alignment and then you can upload it to Let's MT and Let's MT then does the word alignment for you and uses it in the statistical machine translation. You can also have the Let's MT system do the sentence alignment for you, you can upload parallel corpus and Let's MT does the sentence alignment but then you do not have any influence on it anymore and you do not see how good the sentence alignment is. Whereas here you can check and see, ah, there's an error, and I'll uh, fix this, and no, this is really good, and then export it from here and import it in the Let's MT system. Okay. Out of oxygen here, I guess. And So, let's summarize. I have actually done through the first two parts of what I wanted to present today. So, number three and four are still missing for, but still open for tomorrow. What I would like you to do, if you like to do this, um, yesterday we have had the task of using this Let's MT system to train a system based on a corpus that they had. Now, my suggestion to you is select your own corpus from Clarine or from the Opus website. Maybe we should have a quick look at the Opus website. It's already here. There is a number of parallel corpora that have been compiled by my colleague Jörg Tiedemann at the University of Uppsala, now at the University of Helsinki. And you can see which of these corpora have your languages. So for example, you can take a corpus on subtitles. This is not what I wanted to look at. Shouldn't do this without preparing this carefully. There is a collection of subtitles and you can see how many subtitles there are in your language pair. Download this and then use it for training in Let's MT. You can also collect uh, parallel corpora from other sources, from Clarine as uh, Daya mentioned this morning or from if you have brought your parallel corpora, if you have parallel corpora, whatever, you can use this, upload it to Let's MT do the sentence alignment with the Intertext system if you like, do it with the Let's MT system if you like, and then build another MT system based on it. That's a possible task.